I want to read the passage and then we'll see what God has for us in these words, His Word. Matthew 14, beginning of verse 22 through verse 33. Immediately, Jesus made His disciples get into the boat and go before Him to the other side while He sent the multitudes away. And when He had sent the multitudes away, He went up on the mountain by Himself to pray. Now when evening came, He was alone there, but the boat. The boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost, it's a spirit, it's an apparition, it's be translated a number of ways but the idea is a ghost and they cried out for fear but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying be of good cheer be courageous be of good courage it is I do not be afraid and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. And said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Oh boy, I, you know, just reading that, I feel like I, the message has been preached. And I hope God's word resonated with your soul as we, as we read that. And I know preaching is more than just reading. And so I'm going to preach. I'm going to try to preach. This is powerful. The disciples have just witnessed the unbelievable miracle of Jesus feeding about 5,000 men plus men and or women and children. And they'd gathered 12 baskets full of leftovers. He certainly left no doubt that he is compassionate. But he's not just compassionate like we might be compassionate. We'd like to do something, but we can't do it. He was compassionate and able to do something about it. He was able to provide. And he demonstrated that, didn't he? He demonstrated that compassion and that power. But, but who is he? And by the next morning, these disciples are going to at least go one step further in knowing who He really is. Because by the next morning, they're going to make that confession that we saw in verse 33. The first time Jesus did something great, kind of like this, in the boat, they said, what manner of man is this? This time, they don't ask that question. This time they say, truly, He is. You are the Son of God. But they knew enough, at least at this point, after the feeding of the 5,000, they knew enough that they did not want to be separated from Him. 
And perhaps Jesus perceived that they were affected by the messianic fervor of the crowd. Remember, John talked about that. They wanted to make Jesus king. And there was an improper motivation, an improper thinking, and Jesus knew that, and he wasn't going to accept a crown at that point. And you know why, don't you? Because there's a cross preceded the crown. And he had to go through the suffering before receiving the crown. The excited crowd needed to be sent away. And that's what happened. Jesus, first of all, he said, verse 22, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. It's interesting how that's phrased. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. Now that's where I get the idea. They didn't want to go. But that word made is the idea of they were constrained to do it. They were compelled to do it by, by Jesus. And then when they got into the boat, he turned away the excited crowd, dispersed them. And for more reasons than one, but we'll stick with the context of our text here, Jesus needed some time alone. And so verse 23 says, and when he had sent the multitudes away. And so that messianic fervor was dispelled and dispersed and, and he went back into the mountain alone to pray. When evening came, he was alone there. Jesus needed time alone with his father. He needed time to recharge. It had been a busy day, probably longer than just a busy day, but it had been a very busy day. Remember, he had gone over to that side, the northwest, the northeast side of Galilee, for the purpose of getting some, some rest, it seems, and just to, to get away with his disciples. That hadn't happened. He needed to recharge. He needed to commune with his father, but he also needed to intercede for his disciples. You see, his disciples needed to learn more about him, just like you and me. His disciples needed to learn more about him. And he knew what they were about to face as they launched off into the Sea of Galilee. And so he went alone to pray. And let me just give this note here. Any effective ministry requires solitude and recharge time through prayer. We can't always, and this goes for any of this, this doesn't just go for preachers. Anybody who is engaged in any kind of ministry to any degree, and especially intense kind of ministry, we can't always be doing and giving. We will run out of gas. Prayer is vital for our own personal spiritual stamina and for effectual intercession which is what Jesus is doing. Well, Matthew gives the account here of Jesus walking on the stormy sea. He's not the only one that gives this account. Mark gives it. John gives it. Luke doesn't give it. But Matthew's the only one that talks about Peter. And so this is significant. It's significant in forming the thoughts that are coming to you this morning. Matthew is emphasizing something to us. He's emphasizing to us the fear of the disciples in the face of a stormy trial. In verse 26, he, he gives us that idea. They were troubled. They cried out for fear. Verse 27, do not be afraid. And then into the example with Peter, which is left out of the other accounts, he says in verse 30, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And so there's this focus upon the, the fear of the disciples. And then recording for us what Jesus taught his believing followers in real time. Time. By the way, Jesus is teaching us in real time as well. But we're learning from what he taught others in real time as we read his word. So that it isn't always necessary for us to go through the same experiences to learn the same thing. We can learn by the examples that he gives. But sometimes the best teacher is the experience. And he sometimes takes us through it. In fact, I would say 
most of the time for us to learn deeply and learn well we have to go through experiences and he guides us in that as we'll see the brethren Jesus is teaching us through this example the Holy Spirit who who led Matthew to write as he wrote is teaching us that we have no legitimate cause for worry or for fear now fear is not an inherently evil emotion in fact, it's a God-given emotion that can be very helpful, can't it? I mean, that's one of the things that keeps us from doing things that we shouldn't do, is this healthy fear that comes over us, fear of consequences, fear of what might happen. I'm talking about legitimate fear. But fear can be crippling in our lives, and it keeps us from courage and peace as we live the Christian life in this world in which we are promised tribulation. You heard that in the last hour. We're promised trials. We're promised providential difficulties. And even if you can't necessarily find a scripture that says you're promised providential difficulties, you can see it all through scripture and you see it in your own life. Your own lives. And repeatedly, Jehovah God tells his people not to fear. Did you notice that in Genesis this morning? Did you notice that when Jehovah appeared to Isaac? Jehovah, what, did, what did Jehovah say to Isaac? Fear not. I am with you. And then over and over again, you find this expression, do not be afraid or fear not. In fact, it's well over probably 50 times. In Scripture, as the nation of Israel, Moses was going to die. And he was telling the children of Israel this at the end of Deuteronomy. And Joshua was going to take over. And these are the words that, that Moses communicated to the children of Israel. In Deuteronomy 31, 6, be strong and of good courage. Be of good cheer. That's the idea. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them for the Lord your God. He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And then the Lord confirms these words to Joshua more than once. But in Joshua 1 and verse 9, Have not, a com have not I commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Isaiah 41 10 fear not for I am with you be not dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you yea I will help you I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness or my righteous right hand and then we read in Isaiah 43 verse 1 but now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. From this passage, I want to think with you today about the cause of fear. Now other things can be said about this than what I'll say. I'm restricting my thoughts. They're being guided by the, by the text here. But I want you to think through the cause of fear and then the remedy. And I really have prayed, and I, even as I say this, it is my prayer that the result of all of this, the result of this message will be that all who are in the boat, full of believers, worshiping Jesus that you and I will be able to say truly you are the Son of God and that will resonate within your soul and affect you in your life to be able to face whatever it is that God ordains to bring your way in a way that he intends for you to face it so let's think about the cause of fear now, fear comes in a context of trouble, of the anticipation of it or the experience of it. 
It is the context then that permits fear to develop within a person and to take over. In other words, fear is not necessary. Just because you're going through a great difficulty or anticipating going through does not mean that you have to fear, as we will see. If faith is, fo is focused, if, if your faith, the faith that you have is, that's been given to you, if it's focused, circumstances will not give rise to crippling fear. Fear arose in the context that we're looking at here. The context of sudden, unexpected circumstances. This boat, this boat had confident, professional fishermen in it. At least four of the men made their living, and they made their living on that sea. They knew this lake, Gennesaret, or the Sea of Galilee. Launching out, even at night, was not a risky move for them. Had I been there, and I'd been one of the sailors... I might have been a little unnerved, but if I had somebody with me like one of those four, all four of those apostles who were fishermen, I might felt, I felt pretty confident they know this lake. They don't seem to be afraid. I'm going to feed off of them. I'm not going to be afraid. In other words, they weren't testing God and in getting into this boat and going across this lake. They weren't running from Christ. You do remember somebody who ran from God and a storm brewed on the lake? That's not what's going on here. This is not a Jonah event. They had no reason. Listen, they had no reason to expect God's corrective discipline. Now, it may be that you do. It may be that you are running from God. It may be that you are engaged in some sort of activity that you're wondering, is lightning going to strike? There's some storm going to come my way. That's not what's going on here. They were doing His will. Christ told them to. He told them to go. They were not fearing some judgment. It was in the context then of obedience that they find themselves being tossed about in the middle of the sea, unable to control the boat. These professional fishermen unable to control the vessel and completely exhausted by the fourth watch of the morning. They'd been doing this for six, eight hours. They'd been fighting the storm, fighting the winds. It may be that they had given up hope. It reminds me of the event in, when Paul was going on the vessel to Rome. Remember the free ride that he got to Rome. And, and there was a huge storm that arose. And in, in Acts 27 and verse 20, it says that on that ship, they lost hope. I may come back to that passage later if my time doesn't run out just to read the portion. But if I don't, go read it. Because later, not now, later. They lost hope, but Paul didn't. And he uses some of the same language we find in our passage. But that's what happens, you see, when fear takes over. In that tumultuous experience, their minds, these who were in this boat on that, in that night, their minds were consumed with the threat that was at hand. Jesus was nowhere near. And they knew he had the power to calm the storm, right? They knew that. They'd seen him do it. But he wasn't with them. And even when he showed up, they mistook him as a ghost. They didn't recognize him. I suppose you could, you could offer other reasons for why they didn't recognize him. It was nighttime. Uh, I, I'm assuming that there was at least enough light from maybe the moon broke through the cloud. I don't know how it was, but at least there was some way that they saw the figure of Him. They didn't recognize Him, though, I believe, because they weren't expecting Him. This is a faith issue here, as, we're, as, we'll, as we see. And by the way, a man can't walk on the water. So it makes sense, doesn't it, that they wouldn't think that that was Jesus, who they had just seen in person on the shore. A man can't walk on water. 
So we don't want to mock them in saying, it's a ghost, there's a ghost. But it wasn't that there was no faith at all in these men. Jesus said to Peter, oh, you of little faith. He didn't say, oh, you of no faith. And Peter walked on the water, didn't he? And he walked on the water at Jesus' command. But then the storm was still raging. And fear returned as he was distracted by the storm. And so faith was hindered by doubt. We'll come back to that a little later on. You see, his, his attention was divided and fear took over. Fear. Now, beloved, we're not in a literal boat on the sea. Uh, yet there, there are literal experiences that we encounter, and maybe some you know, for us. Remember, up until about not too long ago, um, traveling by boat was the only way you got from here to another nation and sometimes crossing lakes and rivers and so forth. And so this was even more probably real to people before our age. We're in an age where it's sometimes tough for us to, to relate to what's going on here. But we are in literal vehicles and literal planes and literal. So you could, if you want to transfer your thoughts to something like that and get into a turbulent uh, storm in the air and, and, you know, you're shaken all about. But I'm thinking that this represents something more than that. This is representing the storms of life. And sometimes... And our experiences are literal. We're not talking here about just mythical experiences. We're talking about reality. We're talking about where we live. We are in boats. We are crossing seas. We are living life, aren't we? And there are sudden, unexpected circumstances and sometimes in rapid fire succession that come our way, that feels a lot like verse 24, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea. You ever felt like that? Tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And so we're tested and exposed. Fear arises when things in our lives seem out of control and we're not sure what's coming next. We row and we row and we row and we do our dead level best to get to shore, but we get no closer and we can't see the shore. We don't know what's coming next. We lose hope. We lose hope that anyone who can help is watching or cares. We know there's somebody who we think can do something about it. But where is he? So fear increases when our minds are fixated upon our difficult circumstances. All is dark. And when all is dark, beloved, we can miss the presence of Jesus when He is near. And we can even interpret His presence as a ghost. And I hope I'm not going too far here in making at least an application. We may mistake His presence as a ghost or some demonic force in control of the storm. Surely Jesus isn't in control. Surely God's not in control. This is a ghost. It's whatever I'm seeing out there. So you're the one that's responsible for your intending evil. And the exercise of faith is weakened. And we lose hope. We think and we fear the worst. We fear all is lost. Have you had those moments? Hopefully you don't stay there, but they come. And you fear all is lost. And thankfully, hopefully it's your case that you're recovered quickly from that. But not everybody recovers quickly from that. And we feel alone. We feel. We don't just fear. We feel alone. And we feel abandoned. We're not experiencing what we need to be experiencing. Amen. 
And even when we are assured that Jesus is with us, and perhaps we make some bold step like Peter. You know, we, we actually step out. We, fear is abated there for a moment. We, we, get, we work our way out of the boat and onto the, the stormy sea. It, it wasn't calm. It was still stormy. And he, he, but if the storm continues, we are tempted to focus just like Peter did. To focus again upon the effects of the storm and doubt the care of our Savior, even though we know He's there. Fear blinds and doubt distracts us from Jesus. Fear traumatizes us emotionally and separates us from the experience of peace. Stuart mentioned this in the last hour. The experience of peace in the storms of life. So what's the remedy? What's the remedy for fear? Let me ask you this question. Were these disciples safe? I'm not asking you, did they know they were safe? We've got the record. We, you know, we're, not in, we're not in the moment, right? We're not living it. So if we were there, we would say, I don't know. I don't know. But I'm saying, from what you know now, you're reading the story, you see. Would you say, it's like Job. You know, Job didn't know the end, did he? And so, so, but, so what, would, did, were they safe? The answer has to be, yes, they were safe. But it was only as they knew and believed would they experience the sense of that safety, which is peace. And we could add other attributes as well. Joy. A calm in their spirit in the midst of the storm. But there are things that we know and there are things that we see in this account that, that hopefully faith in you connects with so that you don't have to go through something and get to the other side and say, oh, now I know that He was with me the whole time. That, that's the point. See, like in this account, in this account, Jesus is not oblivious to the circumstances of your, of your life. You must believe this. Jesus is not oblivious to the circumstances of your life. He sent these men, these disciples, into a storm. He knew it was coming. He could have delayed their departure, couldn't He? He didn't need to do like we do, get on our weather app to see if we can have an outside picnic tomorrow. He, he, knew, he knew it already. He knew it. He's a, yes, he's a man, but he's the sovereign Christ as well. He knew. And by the way, he'd been talking to his father. And don't you think that if there was some question, if you want to take that route, and he was praying to his father, he could have said to his father, Father, what's the weather forecast? He could have gotten the answers. He could have prevented the storm. I mean, we, we do know, don't we, that the winds and the waves obey His voice? And they still do. They still do. Do you believe this? It's critical, you see. It's critical to your peace. Fear. Fear is going to creep in if you don't lay hold of these truths in faith. And furthermore, Jesus saw the plight of the disciples. In Mark chapter 6, in verse 48, as he gives the account, he says this, Then he, Jesus, saw them straining and rowing, for the wind was against them. He saw it. And so in your life, if you, if you ever are tempted to say, Jesus, don't you see what I'm going through? The answer is yes, Yes, son. Yes, daughter. I see it. I see it. 
Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed by them, Mark says. It appeared that he was just on a stroll. That's kind of wild the way the biblical writers say this. You know, they, don't, they don't park it and say, get a load of that. That's incredible. Somebody walking on the It's just, he was walking on the sea. As if that's what he does. Verse 25. He knew exactly where they were. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them. He wasn't wandering all over the lake trying to find them, wondering where they were. He knew exactly where they were as He walked on the sea. I'm convinced He walked right to them. Did Jesus care? He said, well, if He cared, why didn't He prevent it? Listen, Jesus was doing something. There was a point here to it all. Did Jesus care? And the answer is absolutely yes. And here's one of the things that stands out to me from Matthew's accounting is this. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. And Jesus didn't laugh them to scorn. What does verse 27 say? Immediately, immediately, Jesus spoke to them. And then when Peter, out of fear, he was seeking, and in fear, cried out, Lord, save me. You see it again. This is emphasized immediately. By the way, the word immediately is used, is used three times in this context. Verse 22, verse 27, and verse 31. Immediately. He didn't delay or chide the disciples for their fear. And then he caught Peter before talking to him. He caught him. And then he spoke to him. Did Jesus care? Oh, yes. And if a storm in life is severe enough, you and I can be just like these disciples and we can feel discombobulated and afraid. We don't know which end is up. We're not sure what the next step is going to hold for us. And sometimes we feel that way. We feel like, what has happened so far? What's coming next? But be assured, child of God, that He who loves you, loves you to the end, and He hears your cries, He cares, the storms in your life are not meaningless. And what He says to, to these disciples, He says to you, you can insert yourself into this boat and you can receive what is being said to these disciples as if it's being said to you if you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing and believing who Jesus is and that He is present gives courage and dispels ungodly fear. Now, that may sound elementary, but I am convinced sometimes we get too big for our britches. We move way beyond the childlike spirit that we're supposed to have. And we get all tangled up and we lose what is right there before us. And we therefore do not experience precisely what Jesus intends for us to experience. Immediately, verse 27, Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus identifies himself. He says, isn't that wonderful? Isn't it beautiful? It is I, he says. It is I. The one who rebuked the winds and the sea once before. Do you remember? And they listened to me. It is I. The one who just fed. But think about what I just did. The impossible. It is 
I am here. I am here. And that, that translation, it is I, and some translations may say I am here. Another way to translate that is I am. It is ego a me. I am. And while the disciples may be pardoned, maybe they would be, could be excused for not thinking the things that we think about. Maybe they didn't make the connection that at least I make in my mind when I read those words. Surely, surely the Holy Spirit intends for us to make this connection that Jesus is Jehovah. The great I am is standing there with these disciples. The very one who said, Fear not, for I am with you. All of those repetitious expressions in the Old Testament scriptures that came from Jehovah. He is in the flesh standing with the disciples saying, I am. I am. Be of good courage. Be of good cheer. Do not be afraid. Now, were he merely a man, these words would fall flat, wouldn't they? Oh, but truly, he is the Son of God. He is. And because of who he is, he can say with great love and compassion for his own that ought to resonate in our souls. Can you hear him say this? Regardless of where you are in your life, regardless of what you're going through, can you hear him say this? It is I, be of good cheer, be of good courage. Take courage, don't be afraid. Yeah, but what's going to happen next? I'm here. It's I. It's I. And take note that this is all transpiring in the midst of the storm. Not after the wind ceased. Believer, the storms of life will not go on endlessly. But while they rage, there is no need for crippling fear. It is not necessary for the storm to stop before you can experience courage and cheerfulness and peace. Now the question perhaps needs to be asked, is Jesus with us? Is he with you? Well, well, certainly not in body. He is not here in the flesh. In fact, Paul said, we know him no longer after the flesh. But it's even better. At least for now. In John chapter 14, listen to the words of this same Jesus. This, of course, is after this event. He's getting ready for the cross. He's actually getting ready to, for the ascension here. You know, And this is all going to take place after he ascends. But he says, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, another helper, that he may abide with you forever. This is John 14, 16. And then, continuing to verse 18, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I, Jesus is saying, I will not leave you, my memory, comfortless. I will not leave you orphans I will come to you I will come to you how so John 16 7 nevertheless I tell you the truth Jesus in the flesh he's speaking it's to your advantage that I go away for if I do not go away the helper, the comforter will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you so that it is not necessary for Jesus in the flesh to walk out on the sea to be with you. He is ever with you. Ever with you. By the Spirit. 
He said to the disciples after his resurrection, Lo, I am with you always. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And if you could see that in the original, you'd see that's stronger than even the English. No, not, no, not. It can't happen. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. In this case, what man can do to me, which is another application, but I will not fear regardless, whether it's the elements of life, circumstances of life, or somebody coming against me. And as we have heard recently, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, is that perfect love in us and is the God-given basis that ungodly fear should be dispelled, can be dispelled, should be dispelled. And it's because of His presence. But while, while we as God's children have no legitimate reason for crippling fear because we do have that perfect love in us, we do have Him with us always. The, the problem is we are not always relating to Him in faith. We get distracted. And therefore it continues here. Peter answered and said, Lord, if it is You, Command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. When Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And from this account, immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and called him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? From this account, we know that when faith lapses, in the midst of a storm. Have you ever had that happen? But even when faith lapses in the midst of a storm, guess who is still ever present? He's ever present to help us. He is there. Peter seems to fearlessly step into the raging sea because Jesus said, what did Jesus say? In verse 29, Jesus said, come Oh man, that just, that affects me when I just hear those words. He says, come. Come. Why did Peter walk on the water? It's phenomenal to me, all of the things that commentators come up with answering that simple question. Why did Peter walk on the water? Do you know why? Jesus said, come. In fact, the text says this. Look at it. The end of verse 29. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. That's why he walked on the water. He had to get to Jesus. And the storm was not going to prevent him from getting to where he knew he needed to be. Jesus was standing in the storm. And so, if that's the only way I'm going to get to Him, I'm getting into the water. I'm going right into the storm. I'm getting out of whatever safety there may have been in the boat. And I'm jumping right into that storm. I need to be with Jesus. I need to go to Him. Why did Peter begin to sink? Jesus said it was because of doubt. And that word doubt there, it's only used twice in the New Testament as I recall. But that particular, it's a Greek word, there are other words for doubt. But this one in particular is the idea of, of having a divided focus. It comes from a root of two. It's a partitioned way of thinking. It's, in, other, in other words, he was distracted. The waves caught his attention and he took his attention off of Jesus. There was a wavering in his faith. 
And so beginning to sink, verse 30 says, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Peter's response was immediate and it was intense. Lord, save me. And I want you to see this. Peter was a child of God. And it says, beginning to sink, he cried out. But Jesus would not let him sink. Beginning to sink. He hadn't sunk. Jesus wouldn't let him sink. But Peter cried out, beginning to sink. And Jesus responds. And the first response is to grab, is to stretch out his hand, and he caught him. Peter was close enough. You say, how far, how far was Jesus away from the, from the boat? I don't know. But we know, whatever the distance was, Peter had made enough ground walking far enough to where Jesus was able to grab him, stretched out his hand and grabbed him. And then he said to him, and I, I think this is a tender moment, and I don't think this is a scolding question, and I think... Probably Jesus was looking to the very eyes of, Je uh, of Peter just like, just like Jesus, just like Jesus looked at him when he denied him. Remember, Jesus looked at him and Peter wept. You remember that? And I don't think that was a scolding look. It was a tender look Amen. of the Savior who loved his own. And he says to Peter, and it's interesting, if you could see the original, it's one word. Oh, ye of little faith. It's one word. And it's translated literally, little faith. Oh, little faith. Not oh, you of little faith, but oh, he characterizes him as little faith. That's interesting. Peter was a rock, a stone. What do stones do when they're in the water? <laughs> they sink. Unless they're supported by the rock that doesn't sink. Little faith. Oh, you have faith. You were doing so well. You walked on the water. You were doing so well. Why did you doubt? Can you hear it that way? Why did you doubt? There was no reason for you to doubt. I am. You, you know what I can do. You know I'm not going to let any harm come your way. And anything that happens in your life, you know I am overseeing it. I care for you. You are mine. Isaiah 43, I call my sons from the north. I call my daughters from the south. That's what's going on now in this world. As he gathers his own and, and we're his. And maybe we have little faith, but we have faith. And that faith is growing. Peter's faith grew. He writes about it, doesn't he, in First Peter. It grew. And this incident was part of that growing. Peter doubted, but Jesus didn't. There was no question in Jesus' mind. No doubt in Jesus' mind. And so Jesus and Peter, this, remember, this is all happening in the storm. And if you've ever been out, I mean, I was just on a ship, and we had kind of a, a, a really wavy, bumpy ride on the last night, the last evening and night. And you go outside, and it's, there's noise out there on the sea. And so I, I just was picturing this transaction here, and they're sort of hollering at each other because you can't just whisper. And they didn't have hearing aids back then either. I mean, it was, it was hollered. They were lifting their voices. And I can just picture. I mean, remember, Jesus, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. And I can just picture them walking hand in hand back to the boat. And it, the storm is still going. But there's peace with Peter. He's with his Savior. The master of the seas has his hand. And so they walk together, hand in hand, back to the boat, in the storm. 
And then, that's when it happened, then the winds gave up. Verse 32, and when they got into the boat, the winds, the wind ceased. Now that sounds very, you know, just sort of matter of fact, the wind ceased. If you could see the word ceased in the original, it has the idea that it wore out. It wore, in other words, it was, I get the picture that these storms were, were battering Peter's faith, the faith of these disciples, but it didn't win. It wore out. It gave out a steam. Kind of like Satan tempting Jesus. And he finally had to give up. And for a season he left him. That doesn't mean a storm won't come again. But it won't last forever. And of course there'll come a day when there'll be no storms at all. But fear. Fear was dispelled by faith in Jesus, the Son of God. And all who were in the boat worshipped. Verse 33. All of them saw Jesus for who he was. And they worshipped him. Brethren, because of who Jesus is, the one that we worship, we've got to get to a point where we're beyond trying to explain Him and worship Him. Worship Him. You say, but I... I need to know more. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know about that. But worship Him. And as He reveals more to you, worship Him. And as He reveals more to you, worship Him. But don't get stuck in this place of just trying to figure everything out about God. Or the Son of God. Beloved, we have no reason, we have no cause for worry or fear, child of God. You are safe. You're safe forever because of Jesus. But here's the, I suppose, the kicker. It is knowing and believing that He loves you. And that He who loves you is watching and He's ordering and He's with you always. I, I Therefore, I am confident of this very thing. That He which has begun a good work in me will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. And I know on the way, I know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are the called according to His purpose. He is overseeing it all. Therefore, in everything I can give thanks, thanks for this is the will of God. This, whatever is going on in my life, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And when you are living in that place, even when the storms come, Crippling fear can be dispelled. What do you do when you lose sight of Him? What do you do when you begin to sink because you've gotten your attention upon the storms of life? What do you do? Follow Peter's lead. What do you do? Cry out. Lord, save me. Now you can take another route. I'm such a rotten, low-life, groveling sinner. Why did I doubt? You can do that. And I'm not saying you shouldn't confess your sin. But beloved, you better not stay there. There's no peace. There's no joy there. No, you cry out, Lord, save me. And you learn to trust Him more. And then the next time it happens, you learn to trust Him more. And what's happening? You're growing. You're maturing. And you're going to make it to the shore. The haven of rest. You're, you're going to get there. Not because of you, but because of Him. Don't let fear and doubt continue to distract you from Him. By the way, once they got into the boat, 
was it John's account that says they were immediately? <laughs> Figure that one out. But that's, that's saying something to us, isn't it? And let me close. This is real simple because we have unbelievers in the room here. And I don't know, maybe, maybe you've been listening. There's an application here for you. Do you feel the weight of the guilt of sin in your life? Do you, I mean, do you feel it? Do you feel like, I, I'm sinking. I, I don't know that I, I don't know that there's any hope for me. I want to tell you there is hope. There is hope. And a hymn writer captured it this way. I want to close with these words, which are really applicable, I think, to believers as well. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters, lifted me now. Safe am I, love lifted me.